where the years seem to pass us by very quickly, don't they? Here we are, facing another Thanksgiving. I can't believe we're here at this point. Uh, and Thanksgiving really is about remembering, is it not? It's about remembering the goodness of God in our lives. It's about remembering loved ones who might have gone before us. And sometimes you might say, well, that's a sad thing to remember those who have died. No, I choose to be thankful for the lives of individuals. If we could just think back for those who sat in the many chairs here in our sanctuary. Uh, I was reflecting on that this week of how thankful I was. I would enter the church and they would always be here, uh, uh, Judy and Joe. They were always part of the church and they were always here. Uh, although that they're home with the Lord, uh, that is a great blessing. Uh, Pastor Bob, you know, I think about him. He was always in the church. Uh, I'm so thankful for his life that he shared with me. And so I, I, I rejoice uh, in his life. And not only those who have passed and gone on to glory, but those who passed through the grips of our lives. You know, those who uh, made an impact. I'm very thankful when I used to think of Jane, you know, especially a day like today when we don't have our organ player. Uh, very grateful for Jane and Alice as they, uh, you know, chimed in together. We were so blessed at that point in time. Uh, you could be sad and say, oh boy, you know, I wish he was here. No, I choose to say, thank God we had that time with them to share with them. And they uh, encouraged us, those span in our lives. So, you know, that is the same way as today we reflect on what God has given us. Amen? Amen. You know, Thanksgiving was always about reflecting on the goodness of God. Our founding fathers, uh, they were so thankful for the harvest that was given to them. Uh, they were in some harsh elements. And how many know that even though you have all the luxuries today, and sometimes I would ask, you know, a, a wife or a husband, what are you thankful for? And they'd say, well, you know, the modern luxuries, you know, I don't have to turn with a washing machine and, and wash it by hand. You know, I just put it in there and I got my own dryer. And, and years ago, we didn't have all those luxuries and we have great luxuries today. But that's not really what we should be thankful for, is it? What we really should be thankful for is that God gives us breath in our lungs. He is the one who created us and allows us to have a relationship with Him. That is the greatest thing uh, that has been given to humanity, is it not? Amen. That we are able to have a relationship with the God of all creation and He loves us. And sure, through the struggles of life, we get to know Him in a greater way. And that's what I'm going to tell you. You know, so don't say, oh man, things are miserable, I've been going through a real tough time. But remember this, through the tough time, through the adversity, we grow to know who God is. And just like the pilgrims that went before us, that landed here at Plymouth Rock, they landed in some harsh environments. They had to grow their own food, they, they had to hunt down their own meat. And many died trying that. And what did they leave? They left a place of tyranny where they were dictated to whom they would go and worship. We, today, we live in a country where no one is going to restrict our hearts of whom we worship. You might bow my hands, you might chain me, but God's word is not chained. Hallelujah. You see? And that is where freedom comes. The freedom that we are set free from was the burden of sin. You see, that is the true freedom. God's only Son came, died on the cross so that we would have freedom. Freedom to choose and to worship. You might bound me up, you might put me in prison, you might kill my body, but you're not going to take my soul. Hallelujah. See, there may be many fears, and some are fearful of what's coming upon the earth. Jesus tells us, do not fear. These things have to transpire. You say, well, why, Pastor Bob? I just want things to be leveled out. Well, as Brian had already prayed, maybe through these adverse conditions, through this evil, good will be brought about. That God will be glorified. That God will be sovereign in the midst of it. He's sovereign, but that we would see Him sovereign. Amen? Amen. To give thanks to God is 
the opposite or the contrast of being ungrateful. Do you know ungrateful or being ungratefulness is a sign of an unbeliever? We find in 2 Timothy chapter uh, 3, in the third verse or so, it says that these are signs of an unbeliever. Ungratefulness. You see? Uh, when you have an attitude of gratitude and you're thankful, it turns your whole eyes in a different direction. It puts a pep in your step. It, got, it gives you uh, something to contrast on. When things look negative, you can always find the positive. It's the matter of perception of the way we see things, is it not? Because there's always good if you're sitting here breathing breath in and out today. You see? If you're sitting here this morning and you're able to say, thank you, Jesus, I belong to you, you never had it so good. Amen. You've never had it so good. And that is the right attitude, isn't it? Amen. Because we have to bring that in line and bring that perception <laughs> back. Today, we're going to come to the communion table. And this is a table of remembrance, but it's also a table of thanksgiving. That's what it is. You know, matter of fact, I, if I'm, you might correct me in this, but uh, uh, the, the Latin word for Eucharist is thankful or thanksgiving. And we're going to come to the table this morning with a grateful heart. And the psalm that I chose, I just want to read Psalm uh, 100, but if you read the psalms, especially from like Psalm 93 to uh, and 94, 95, 99, 100, 103, 105, all psalms of praise and thankfulness. But I just want to read Psalm 100 for us. It's five simple verses, and it says this. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Just think of that. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth. Everyone make a joyful noise unto the Lord. What does that joyful noise mean? What, is, what does that mean to us, to make a joyful noise to the Lord? Well, it's an expression of gratitude, isn't it? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You saved my soul. You gave me breath in my lungs. You didn't leave me where I was. <laughs> Hallelujah. And he doesn't leave me where I'm at. But how do you know that we're growing from, from grace to grace? We're, we're going from glory to glory. God has continued to grow us. So he says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all you lands, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with singing. You know, when you can't sing, we have sorrow in our heart. Huh? But we miss the perception. Why do we have sorrow in our heart? Most of the time, it's because we believe that we're not getting what we deserve, but really if we got what we deserve, we'd be in real trouble, wouldn't we? So if you understand we're not getting what we deserve, how can we not sing with joy in our hearts? Be joyful that God loves us and He in our midst and regardless of what's going on, all things are working for our good for those who love Him and have been called according to His purpose. Every Thing that goes on in your life, God is working for your good. We have to say hallelujah to that. I, I once heard someone say this, you know, uh, he must have a tough life because he's always complaining. No, he has a tough life because he complains. <laughs> Do you understand? Amen. Think about that. Always finding the wrong in something. Always negative. Oh, that's never going to work out. But who is your God if that's never going to work out? <clears throat> is it your God bigger than that? Yes. Our God is a big God. Hallelujah. And nothing, listen to this, nothing, absolutely nothing is impossible with God. That's right. We're praying for an individual, and many of you know him, uh, Wayne Simpkins, and the doctors told him that he's not going to walk anymore. Okay? Now, 
We went over there and prayed, laid hands, and asked God to bless him. But we said, thy will be done. Now, whether God gives him mobility back in his legs or not, I'm hoping and praying that God does that. But he still can have joy in all circumstances, for this is the will of God for us in Christ Jesus. Because it is not the mobility of our legs that brings life. It is Jesus Christ that breathes breath into us and gives us new life. We can have joy in all circumstances, for this is the will of God for us. Now granted, I'm not in his position right now, and neither are you. But there are situations in, that we look at that we feel defeated in life, that we become critical in, and we say, where is God in all this? And therefore we become bitter at God, and therefore we blame God. How many know God is not to blame today? How many know that sin is to blame? If you want to hate something, hate sin. Hate evil. See, that's the blame for, that's the manifestation of it. From the fall, sickness, disease, all that came from sin. But praise the Lord, there's a remedy. Glory to God, the remedy is in Jesus Christ. There's the remedy. Listen, we're but a mess. We're only here 60, 70, 80, some 90 years old. Maybe a hundred. But that is just a blink in view of eternity. You see, we're, we're, we're going to be here and then gone. But if you have Christ, you will have joy in your heart because it is the joy of the Lord that brings the strength. It is the joy of knowing that you know Christ. It is the joy of knowing whatever comes down the road will give me the grace to get through it. Hallelujah. Each one here has a testimony, right? Each one here has been tested. But through your, your testing time and your trials of life, uh, through the messes of our life, a message usually arises. A great message from our life. I'm looking at a little Carter there. What a, a joy, you know. Uh, how old is Carter now? Nine months. Uh, maybe 12 months ago, we were praying for little Carter and not knowing what was going to transpire. But we committed him unto the Lord, didn't we? And the doctors had little doubt, or had lots of doubt, I should say, that Carter would ever have a productive life. But how many know that? That little child there is breathing out and just a pleasant little child, just a blessing here to our congregation. Okay. Dedicated him unto the Lord. He belongs to God. And you know, all of his life now, we're going to pray and hope that he too would worship the Savior, the one who has healed him. But we thank him in all circumstances, right? Yeah. So, we come before his presence with singing. Look at this verse 3. Know ye the Lord that he is God. Know that he is God. The Lord, he is God. There is no other. And it is that he that made us. And not we ourselves. We are his people. And the sheep of his pastor. He is God. We are his sheep. He is our shepherd. The Lord is our shepherd. We shall not want. We follow the shepherd. And my sheep hear my voice. If your ears have been clogged up in hearing God's voice, let some praises come out. Let some being thankful in all circumstances come out. The Bible says that God inhabits the praises of His people. When we start to bless His holy name, and we have an attitude of gratitude, and we're starting to be thankful in all situations and circumstances, God, some supernatural way, kind of draws us away, and, and we can kind of see Him for who He is, that He is God. And all that 
I say it like this, Satan sometimes has a magnifying glass. We go through things that are like a molehill and he'll put a magnifying glass on it and it looks monumental. Like, oh, I'm never going to be able to climb over that. When you look at God, those molehills that look like mountains are moved. They're moved. And then you have an attitude of gratitude. Because whatever comes down in my life or your life, it's not out of God's control. That is the fallacy. That is the illusion that we have some control. If you belong to God, He's already ordered your footsteps. Whatever you're facing, He already knows. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. The ways of God are much higher than our ways. Just as the heavens are above the earth, so are God's thoughts above our thoughts. Know ye that He is God, that He has made us, He has formed us, He has knitted us together in our mother's womb. He knew us before we were born. He knew where we were going to be sitting this morning. He knew, that is mind boggling But it is true. And it is a great blessing. So if He was the one who knitted us together in our mother's womb and knew where we were going to live and knew where we were going to be at this in particular time uh, in, in our season of life, don't you think He knows what our tomorrow brings? Why do we fear what tomorrow brings? Do you know fear drives out praise. It drives out faith. And faith and fear cannot come together. They can't... Go ahead, brother. What is it? Coexist. Coexist. That's the word I was looking for. They cannot coexist. They can't. We ask to rise up in faith to drive out fear. And so... We are His. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. We enter His gates with thanksgiving. Listen, He was talking to Israel when they came into the courts. They came in with praise, singing because of the great deliverance of their God, of what He has done for them. Now the parallels that we're going to be looking at this morning, the parallels of Israel as they celebrate their feasts, as we celebrate our thanksgiving, as we celebrate the communion table, it parallels the deliverance of bondage. Praise the Lord. How can you not be thankful if you were bound in sin and destined for hell? Let me just speak bluntly. If you were not bound over and you were destined for hell, and Jesus Christ came and took your sin. And through faith and trust in Him, He has taken you from death to life, from darkness to light. <clears throat> How could you not have a pep in your step? How could you not say, thank you, Jesus? Amen. Unless you don't really believe that. Unless you don't believe that. Unbelief will stifle your praise. It will stifle you being thankful. It would make us ungrateful. If you believe every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, you can't help but lifting your knees a little bit higher today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I can get what I deserve. Regardless of what comes down and what's before me, I love it I'm so good. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Look what it says, be thankful unto him and bless his name. You notice this psalm turns from not being thankful for things, not being thankful for what you have, or even for someone else, but being thankful to God.
For the one gives us the very breath that we breathe. For the Lord is good and his mercies is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. If you turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 8 for a minute, I just want to just pull a couple verses out of here. <coughs> As I was saying, this always ties back to our salvation. It always ties back to deliverance. As it parallels Israel coming out of Egypt, coming out of bondage, the God who went before them, the God who had given them a land for houses they didn't build and vineyards they didn't plant and gave them the olive oil and the olive trees and gave them all this. He says something in the scripture that we need to remember that otherwise we will forget him. And then if we forget him, what happens? We start leading life on our own understanding. We start paralleling uh, our old ways again. Thinking that these hands have made the riches that I have. Thinking that the breath of my lungs has given me the strength to endure uh, what is before me. I I'm here to tell you, he tells us in the scripture, don't allow that to happen. Be grateful. Know that the very breath that you have is given from Him. Look at chapter 8. I'm only going to read a few of the verses, but look at verse 10. It says this, When thou hast eaten, and thou art full. I want you to know that we're in a greatest nation here where the poorest of the poor here is the riches of the richest people in any other nation. You open... Thank God we have a refrigerator to open. And sometimes uh, we can be negative and say, I don't have enough. How many know if you're in Christ, He will supply all of our needs according to the glorious riches which are found in Christ Jesus? Instead of saying, well, I don't have enough steak or filet mignon, I thank you, Lord, for the pork and beans that I might have. You see? And that was exactly what happened to the Israelites when they were being tested across the, 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 the desert land. They were taken out of a place where they had their beaks and their onions and, and God was feeding them manna. But how many know that was a gift from heaven? Amen. How many know that that was an expression of Christ himself giving them our daily bread? And what did they do? Man. I'm tired of eating this. I don't like this stuff. We had it better back in bondage. <clears throat> That's not an attitude of gratitude. That's being ungrateful. God has set us free. Right? So he says here, uh, when you have eaten in full, uh, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he has given thee. Brothers and sisters, we are in that. <coughs> America. But beware, he says here, beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God and not keeping his commands, his judgments and statutes, which I have commanded thee this day, lest when thou have eaten and thou art full and hast built goodly homes to dwell therein, and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied and all thou hast has is multiplied, then thy heart will be lifted up and thou forget. Look at this. The Lord thy God, could you imagine that? Which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Could you read? Could you imagine and say, Oh, I will never forget God? I will never forget God. Remember last week I was saying he wants us to love him with all heart, mind, soul, and strength. He doesn't want just the back bedroom of your house. He doesn't want these little praises here and there. We bring the sacrifices of praise into the house of God. This is what the sacrifice of praise is. It is the fruit of the lips that continually confesses Jesus Christ as Lord. And how you get to there? The sacrifices of God is a broken spirit. And a broken heart and a contrite heart, O oh God, will not despise. 
It is coming to a place and knowing that He is God and we are not. We come to Him and say, Lord, I need you. They are the sacrifices of God that He accepts. They are. Not them. The next verses I want you to see. And many of us went there. Look at verse 17. <coughs> and thou say in thy heart, My power and the might of my hand hath got me this wealth. Wow. <coughs> and then verse 18. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that gives thee the power to get wealth, and that he may establish his covenant, which he swore unto thy fathers as unto this day. What happens when we are ungrateful and your bellies are full, your refrigerator is over, you're living in your big panel houses, we forget where that came from. That came from Him. The wealth you have is not because of your own wisdom or because of your own strength. Some are blessed and gracious to have a little more than us. You should be a little more grateful. But it doesn't matter whether you have much or a lot. The Apostle Paul says, I found the secret to being content in all situations and circumstances. Whether I have much or I have little. Whether I'm clothed or whether I'm naked. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Hallelujah. Praise in His name. Amen. Please don't forget who has given you everything we have. Who has given us this sanctuary to worship in? This is God. Everything should be a testimony to God. Everything should be a testimony to what God has done. You see, whatever adversity that you have climbed, you didn't do it on your own. You must say with that, God has got me through. Hallelujah. When you, when you pass through the waters, God is with you. When, when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. Uh, when you pass through the fires, you shall not be burned. And the flames will not set you ablaze because of Him. Because of Him. And see, the attitude of knowing that even if the body may fail, in which it might, even though that we return to the dust, which it will, He is still sovereign. He is still in control. You see? He is God. He is the one who made you. He is the one who loves you. He is the one who is with you. Now, we're going to celebrate this morning, our communion. We're going to return thanks for the body of Christ. And I just want to read something and give you an insight to something. And this is found in 1 Corinthians. You may turn with me there because we're going to look at a couple of passages before we go into our communion time. And this was given to the Apostle Paul and says, For what I have received of the Lord, that which I also delivered unto thee, or unto you. This is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance, of me. <clears throat> and after the same manner also he took thy cup and when he had supped saying this cup is the cup of the New Testament in my blood this do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup ye do show the Lord's death 
till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat not that bread and drink of that cup in that unworthily matter and come with power for it. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brother, when you come together to eat, tarry for one another. Father, we do pray, O God, give us the insights of thy scripture this morning. Father, as we get ready to prepare to come to the table with a grateful heart, let each man, let each woman, let each child examine their hearts this morning. Father, we ask, O oh God, that you might search us, that you might know us, you know our hearts, and know the anxious thoughts within us. Father, we ask you, Lord, that you might lead us in the ways of everlasting, that you might reveal to us, O oh God, even if there's a pocket of secret sin, O oh God, we confess that to you this morning, that we might be thankful for our salvation and know that we're in right standings with you. And Father, we'll thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. <coughs> I just want to share something that might give you a little bit of hope and a little bit of background of the Passover. If you remember the Passover, that was uh, celebrating the first time there and uh, the, it was called the Egyptian Passover because they were eaten in Egypt, they were in bondage. It parallels our sin. But they were in bondage and they had uh, slave uh, taskmasters and they were slaves to the Egyptians. And God said to take a sacrifice and take the blood of a lamb without a blemish and put it upon your door frames and your and your uh, sides of your doors and the, the angel of destruction shall pass over and will not bring destruction upon you. One thing he wants to parallel with that is this. The Passover that the, the Jewish people had celebrated was a once and for all sacrifice. There was no other sacrifice like that. God had told them to commemorate or to bring in remembering year after year what he has done for them. Now as we come to the table, we are to commemorate or remember what the Lord has done for us. Amen? Amen. That He died on the cross for us. He shed His blood on Calvary and He has taken His blood for, say, for every believer and put it over us. So therefore the angel or the, the, the destruction would go past us or the wrath of God for say. Because that is the true saying. Uh, those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ have life. And those who do not believe in Jesus Christ do not have life. And God's wrath remains on them. So because of the blood of Jesus Christ, the wrath of God is removed from you. I don't know if I do. You should be thankful for that. They had seven feasts that the Israelites, they would celebrate, they were commanded. And all the males, they were to come uh, to Jerusalem, and around Jerusalem, uh, there was a great celebration of the Passover that we understand to be the Lord's Supper, the day that he was betrayed, the Passover, okay? And in that, it was the month of Nisan, and in that month of Nisan, three feasts happened between that day, or that week, I'm sorry. It was an eight-day feast, but it happened, three of them, interlocked. Uh, the first one was the Passover that we were just talking about. The second one was this. It was called the Feast of the Young Leaven Bread. They were to leave their Egypt with haste 
And they weren't to put any lemon into their bread. And that lemon represents evil. Okay? That was the second feast that they were supposed to celebrate. That was Friday, was the Passover. Saturday, which uh, was their uh, Sabbath day. Okay? Where uh, the, the feast of uh, unleavened bread was continued to be celebrated. But there was something special that happened on the Sunday. The Sunday was called the Feast of First Fruits. Three days later. Are you getting the parallel? It's happening. The Feast of First Fruits. You see? And why is this important to us? To understand that what God has already portrayed prophetically, He is going to do in the natural for us. The, the feast of first fruits went like this. On that Sunday morning, the priest would go out into the harvest and he would take a sheaf. And uh, some of the historians would say they would bundle a number of them, but they would bring them to the temple and before the altar, they would wave them before the altar, the sheaf. What they were doing was anticipating the harvest. Right? But I'm here to tell you that Paul parallels that in the scripture. That was called the Feast of First Fruits. If you look over at chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians and just look at verse 19 through 23, and it says this. If it is just this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. If you just have hope for what God can give you right here, you are most miserable is what he's saying. But now in Christ, risen from the dead, and become the first fruits of all them that sleep. Okay? For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ, the firstfruits, afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. We are celebrating the communion table, what? He tells us his death, his burial, and his resurrection. That is the hope that we have as believers. It's not a resurrection as if uh, Christ just raised Lazarus from the dead, dead because Lazarus died again. It's not the resurrection of Jairus' daughter. She died again. It's not the resurrection of the young man at Nain because he died again. It is the resurrection of Christ, the first fruit, that he does not die again. And that is what you and I hope for. That is what you and I are included in. That is why we celebrate at this table, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And we live forevermore because of our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you see Him, you shall be like Him. You shall have a body like Him. Glory to God. If you understand the prophetic areas of the feast that, that went before us, the parallels that now have already been fulfilled in Christ Jesus, there are more that are yet to come. And there are three other feasts. And I'll just give you briefly, the next one that's coming on the prophetic timetable is called the Feast of Trumpets. And if you know anything about what the Feast of Trumpets are. But I don't want to go into that, but I want you to be encouraged that Christ has gone before us. Death could not hold Him. Death had no sting over Him, nor will it have any sting over you either. If you're in Christ, rejoice in the Lord this morning. Rejoice. And as we come to the table, we rejoice. We rejoice in knowing we belong to Him. All in Adam die, but in Christ we've been made alive. To die no more. You say, Pastor, don't you? this may die, but you don't die. You don't die. And one day you'll have a resurrected body when Christ returns to be like Him. 
That is an awesome, awesome thing. And he proved it by being raised from the dead to die no more. Can't you wait until the day? Pastor Fred, will you help me, Larry? Will you come to the table with me?